Hello and welcome back to Calculus 3. This is the first section of the semester and we are going to talk about vectors in 2D. So first off, what is a vector? It's a mathematical construct, it's abstraction, it doesn't exist, okay? We use it to explain other things, just like numbers. You don't see number two walking down the street that, yeah. Um, it's mathematical abstraction, and we use it to portray either forces or objects. For instance, uh, if you are, let's say, six feet tall, you're just a vector, right? You can be, you can um, imagine, instead of drawing a person, drawing a vector. And this vector is oriented, as you can see, upwards, so it has the 90 degree angle to the, the Mother Earth over here, the ground. And it is, uh, its magnitude, length of that vector is six. So the vector is just this mathematical construct that uh, can portray, let's say, a human standing. Or, for that matter, a human sleeping. There you go, same one. Six feet at the angle of zero degrees is uh, the same uh, the same person. The, but it's a different vector because the direction of that vector is different. So, vectors have magnitude, i.e. length, and direction. angle with positive x-axis. So those are the two features that vectors have. So now when we are talking about two-dimensional vectors, we will draw a two-dimensional coordinate plane. We will draw any vector in that coordinate plane. In my case, this vector u with the notation lowercase u. Upper cases will be used for vector fields in chapter 14. So it has to be lowercase uh, letter. And since we are not distinguishing very well in our notes with bold and non-bold characters, we will always put the arrow above the va uh, variable so that we can distinguish between x, which is a scalar variable, and u, which is a vector variable. So vector u, in my case over here, will be 4, 2. We also use the spiky brackets. Spiky brackets are there to um, show that this is a vector to distinguish from a point whose coordinates are 4, 2. So 4, 2 is just what we call a terminal point of a vector, right? which is a location that the vector is reaching. Now each vector has its initial point and its terminal point. And anytime you write U or V or W or whatever, you will always put these arrows on top, signifying that that's a vector. So vectors have direction and um, so which is the mag uh, sorry direction and magnitude, right? Now for each vector in sp in two uh, D space into the plane, we have the x and the y components for that vector, and we can calculate the magnitude theta, sorry, magnitude um, uh, of u, which is this u in absolute value, 
as the square root of x squared plus y squared, where these are the coordinates. And we can calculate direction. Theta by using the inverse tangent of y over x. So these two formulas will tell us everything we want to know about the vector. Velocity, as a concept that you learned in, in physics, is a vector. Magnitude of velocity is speed. So when you are reading this, the, the traffic sign which says speed limit 40, well, the direction is implied, right? Go with the flow, otherwise you're not going to have a good day, right? All of the traffic moves in the same direction, so there is no reason to specify direction. It's not velocity um, limit, it's a speed limit. It just says, okay, don't go over whatever, 40 miles per hour direction is given because all the traffic should flow the same way. So velocity is an example of a vector. And its magnitude is called the speed. But we also have force is a vector. And you also have a direction and magnitude for the for the um, for the force. So the easiest thing, right, to do with the force is to just have, um, let's say, striking a surface. So which surface you are striking? Uh, that would be the direction of the vector, right? And how hard you hit is the the magnitude. So force is a vector. Time is a scalar. There is no direction to time, right? So um, weight is a force. So it's a vector, but mass is uh, a scalar. So there is no uh, there is no um, direction to mass. Uh, if you studied physics you would know that weight is a force and the weight is give ah, that looks like a work so so the weight is the force and it's m times g mass times gravity and mass is given in kilograms gravity is given meters per second per second so uh, the, that unit com, uh, is called Newton for, for force. So mass in kilograms is given, uh, is a scalar value. There is no direction to mass. There is only the magnitude or how <laughs> heavy something is. So they are not the same concept. You will weigh differently on Earth, Mars, Moon, because it depends on your on the gravity. But if you give your mass in kilograms, then it's the same mass in kilograms, no matter where you are in the in the universe. So mass is the standard uh, unit that doesn't change, and the weight does change depending on on gravity. So if you really want to feel good about yourself for whatever reason, people feel good if they weigh less. I don't know why. Uh, it's just easier to tip over. Um, you should go to the top of the Mount Everest, and then when the moon is directly above you, then you measure yourself, and then you'll be lightest. There you go. Right? 
Yes. Uh, but uh, the force is in terms of like, uh, with the magnitude and direction of forces. So, that magnitude is like how hard. How hard you hit, and the direction is where you hit, right? So you don't have, you don't care if someone swings towards your face with zero force, and you don't care if someone is swinging with large force away from you. So that's that. Makes sense. Great. All right. So that would be that would be it now. Two vectors are the same. If their magnitude and the direction are the same. And another important fact here is vectors are free to move in space. Now these two statements work hand in hand. If I have a coordinate system with a vector u that is 3, 2, as I, as I have it, I'm going to now go here, and this location is 3, 4, and I'm going to put another vector v. This vector v is the same as vector u. Now you will say it's not in the same location. Sure. Remember that I told you that you are a vector? Right? Well, you are at a different location than where you were this morning. Are you the same you? Yeah, you are. Right? So vectors are free to move in space. You see, this, this pen that I'm holding is a vector. It is important which way I point with this vector towards the screen so that I can write. If I point the wrong way, it will be erasing. If I point the other way, it won't be working at all. So if I use it like this, it will not work at all. So I can move this vector and then stuff happens, right, if I move the vector. So it's still the same pen. It's not a different pen if I move it from one location to another location than this vector. This vector didn't change. So I will claim that u is the same as v, vector v, because they have the same direction and they have the same magnitude. <clears throat> now, you would ask, well, how do we know um, if vector v is also 3, 2. Well, we will figure out that the, term, uh, that the initial point, right, initial point is 3, 4. And then terminal point is, and we count that one, it's going to be 6, 6. Vector v is going to be terminal 6 minus initial 3, comma terminal 6 minus initial 4, giving us also 3, 2. Vector is equal to terminal minus initial point. Now, this is not mathematical definition, <laughs> uh, but now, let me, now, parentheses, terminal point minus initial point. Now, let's do better way in defining this. 
So if point A has coordinates of x a, x b, uh, sorry, x a, y a, and point B has coordinates x b, y b, then vector a b you see b is a terminal point because b is under the arrow side of the the vector up there is going to be and now we put the vector notation it's going to be x b minus x a comma y b minus y a and the vector b a is xa minus xb and ya minus yb so to find any vector in space you're simply subtracting the coordinates of the terminal points right initial and terminal point uh, directly derived from this is the fact that vector a b is equal to negative vector b a <laughs> if you just change where the arrow is the vector flips 180 degrees which just subtract uh, swaps uh, a for b that's I mean, uh, it swaps the direction of the vector. Sorry. All right, so find the magnitude and direction of the vector. between points negative 3, 2 and 1, 6 uh, if nothing is specified in a problem the second point is the terminal point if nothing is specified in a problem So figure out the vector, figure out the magnitude, and then direction you can give in degrees. It's okay.
All right, so let's take a look. So vector u is going to be 6 minus negative 3 comma 1 minus 2. So vector is 9 negative 1. Yes? So you're paying attention. Good. Ah, write it from scratch. So 1 minus negative 3 and 6 minus 2. Good. So that's 4, 4. And if you have this as a direction, so magnitude of u is 4 root 2 and theta is 45 degrees or pi over 4. Good. Zero vector is given by zero, zero. It's technically just the point at the origin. Has zero magnitude and no direction. Now you can treat vectors as multi-dimensional numbers. That's what they are, actually. It's just a collection of uh, numbers. So what we can do with numbers is we can add, we can subtract, we can multiply, and so on. So we can scale vectors by multiplying them with a scalar uh, value. Uh, scale meaning make them longer or shorter. By multiplying vector by a scalar value. So if I, and the formula for that would be Cu is C times the components of vector U are U1 and U2, making this CU1, CU2. So let vector U be 4, negative 8. Find one half of vector U. Well, one half of vector U is one half of 4, negative 8 and you just distribute which gives you 2 negative 4 still spiky bracket it's a vector uh, the magnitude clearly gets cut in half the direction is the same so when you scale a vector the direction is preserved We can add and subtract 
vectors. Do it component wise. That means you add x to x and y to y and subtract x to x and y and y to y. So if I have vector u plus or minus vector v, that will simply be a vector u1 plus minus v1, comma u2 plus or minus v2. So these are two formulas in one, addition and subtraction. So at vector u, b3 and negative 1, and vector v to 6, find 2u minus v. So the answer is 4, negative 8. Component form of a vector. It, yeah, this, this lecture is going to go forever. So I hope you booked out forever. 4, 11, 1. So Some of you might have taken linear algebra already and you know about bases and, and, and things like that. This is what we're going to talk about now. We're just not going to use that language. So the 2D coordinate system 
the x and y axis has the grid in x and y direction. Now, there is something that we call a unit vector. I, and we put a little hat rather than the arrow because the hat signifies it's a unit vector. I'll explain that more. And this particular guy is one zero. And there's also a unit vector J, zero one. Now these guys carry the direction of X axis and the Y axis, the X and the Y. And their magnitude is one. So with the help of these little two guys, we can take a vector, let's say three, six, and write it as three I plus six J. So instead of having the vector notation, which includes the terminal point put in a spiky brackets, we can have three I plus six J as the alternate way to write the, the, the same vector. Let's say you have two negative four. Well, that will be two I minus four J as a vector. So we have a unit vector in X direction and unit vector in Y direction. So now, if I want to uh, graph the 3, 6 vector, I will have 1, 2, 3i vectors and then stack up 6 of these j vectors which will give me in the sum vector u. So there are three i in x direction and six j's in the y direction and they all add up. For the other one I will go two and a blue and then four down and that will give me vector v so you can either draw the terminal point which is three six and then draw the vector from the origin or you can uh, do the component form with all bunch of these small i's and, and j's so that's the component form and then for the component form i mean it's just a different way to represent the same thing so you pick uh which notation you like you need to understand and know both but uh when you are doing your homework and, and exam and stuff you can use whatever notation you want Uh, let's see what else I forget. Oh, let's talk more about the unit vector. So now, uh, this unit vector business is extremely important. So unit vector has magnitude equal to 1. That is the importance of the unit vector. And you can have any direction on the unit vector. So the formula for the unit vector is when you take the vector u and you divide it by its magnitude. So technically what you are doing is you are just scaling the vector to have length of one 
and you are preserving the direction. So this formula here makes magnitude 1 while preserving the direction of vector u. Now you can, no coughing, you can, I can't make it straight. Uh, you can um, test that by, let's say, having vector u to be, say, um, let's do something cheap, 3, 4. It's cheap because it's Pythagorean triplet, 3, 4, 5, right? So calculations are easy. So vector u. What is the unit vector here? Well, it's vector 3, 4 divided by magnitude, and the magnitude is 5. So we have 3 fifths and 4 fifths as our unit vector. So if the vector is given as 3, 4, its unit vector is 3 fifths and 4 fifths. Now, if you test the magnitude here, so let's check the magnitude. It better be 1. Uh, Pythagorean theorem for magnitude. 3 squared plus 4 squared, that's uh, 25. Square root is, right? So now we're going to have the magnitude of the unit vector, and it better be 1. So what I have is 9 25s plus 16 25s in the square root, which is square root of 25 over 25, and that's 1. Great. So we check, and we see that the magnitude is 1. So the formula gave us the unit vector, and the unit vector had uh, one and now we check the magnet uh, the direction of vector u and we also check the the direction of the unit vector so this is we know inverse tangent of uh, 4 over 3 now I, I actually don't want to compute this because I'm hoping that the other one will give me the same so let's just Hold on for a second. The second one is inverse tangent of 4 fifths over 4 thirds. No, over 3 fifths. And uh, if you work out the double fraction here, you will have 4 times 5 divided by 3 times 5, and these guys cancel. So whatever this uh, inverse tangent of 4 thirds is, it's the same for vector u and uh, unit vector u. So we see from here, I mean, this is not a proof, <laughs> obviously, this is uh, an example. But we see that, uh, indeed, uh, this is uh, that the unit vector scales the magnitude down to 1 and preserves the direction. So direction of the unit vector and original vector are the same. Good. I think the last thing before we hit some application is to talk about properties of vectors. Now, these properties will translate to any dimension. We learn them for 2D, and then we'll have the same thing happen for 3D and any, any higher dimension you want. These are basic properties of all vectors. 
Uh, number one, it's commutative for addition. So vector u plus vector v is the same as vector v plus vector u. So commutative property. Number two, associated property for addition. So u plus v plus w is the same as u plus v plus w. Three. V plus vector zero is vector V. So if you add zero to a number, you get the same number. If you add the opposites, so V plus negative V, you get vector zero. Five, distributive property. So constant u plus v is the constant u plus constant times vector v. But we can also have two constants, like c plus d, multiplied into vector u, so that's cu plus du. Property 7. 0 times vector v is a 0 vector. Property 8, c times the 0 vector is a 0 vector. Number 9, 1 times vector v is vector v. And finally 10, is the distributive prop uh, is uh, associated property multiplication so you can multiply constants one by one or you can multiply constants first and then so if you are taking the honors option this is the list of things where you can uh, practice the the basic proofs to prove any one of these properties, you simply replace vectors with their components in 2D or 3D. And then uh, you uh, solve the uh, property. So we can pick any, it doesn't matter. Um, something is not going to take forever. Now, let's do number four. So proof for number four. Uh, number four states that V added to its, come on, there we go. Negative is a zero vector. All right, so we say, let vector V be defined as V1, V2. Spiky brackets. All right. Then negative v must be negative one times vector v. I mean components v one and v two, which gives us negative. Now uh, let's put negative v one v two. And uh, that is negative v1, negative v2. So now, if we add these two together, we are going to get vector v, which is v1, v2, plus negative v1, negative v2. And then when you combine, you add them component-wise, so that's v1 plus negative v1, comma, v2 plus negative v2. And finally, that is 0, 0, which is the 0 vector. That's what the proof is. It's very simple, and what you're supposed to do is just you have to write out everything. 
So we define a vector and we define a 2D vector and then we figure out from that vector what the negative vector is. And then you add them component-wise. So all of the proofs uh, on the list are done the same way. Uh, A, B, and C, and D are constants, and then U, V, and W are vectors. So let's say for exam one, uh, one of the questions for the honors option uh, might be part A and B to prove two of these identities. All right. So uh, practice few of these if you are interested in that stuff. So those would be the, the properties. And now the application of vectors. So here is a, a crate, and you want to push this crate. You can push this crate. Now, we are going to see this uh, in more detail later, but right now, you push this crate with the force F. Well, there is the weight of the crate and the weight of the crate creates what we call a normal force which is reactive force which is always perpendicular to the surface that's a normal force you know what i'm going to use uh, fw and fn so you are not confusing these with uh, later on with work and normal vectors and other things that we are going to have in the class all right, so you have the crate. Crate has the weight. The weight of this is mg. So if you know the mass of the crate, let's say 3 kilograms, then you multiply that by 9.81, which is the gravity, and you have the weight. Now the normal force is going to be the same magnitude and uh, opposite direction in this case. So you have to um, account for now. What do I need that for? Well, stuff is not easy to move because of friction. And what creates friction? Well, rubbing two surfaces together creates friction. And these two surfaces well, they don't touch on an atomic level, but we say they touch, right? The surface of the floor and the, and the bottom of the box, they, they touch. So uh, it's going to create uh, friction. Friction is the force which opposes the motion all the time, all right? So friction force, lowercase f, is going to be a constant uh, of uh, friction mu times the normal normal force and you know when you dig deeper into physics and all of these things you know that there is a static coefficient of friction and kinetic right which is the one for motion and so on we don't have to go into gory details here um, and and make the distinction between all of those but uh, I hope that uh, you can follow and appreciate which way all of this happens. Let's let's go and, and, and put some things. So the box exists in the physical realm, therefore the box will have mass. Because the box is not in the weightless space, gravity times the mass creates the weight of the box, which is the force which pushes the the box towards the center of the mass of the larger object, in this case, the Earth. So the, the weight force is pulling down. Now, 
the uh, ground is solid and it pushes back up. The reason why you can sit on those chairs is because your weight is not enough to break the chair. So you sit on a chair, your weight pushes down, the weight pushes up, and you're just able to sit still. Try to sit on water, see what happens, right? So now the weight pushes down, the ground pushes up with the opposite and equal force creating the normal force. Now, the block is just in equilibrium and it's not moving anywhere because it's on the ground level. The instant you push on it with the force F, because the object is heavy, right, because the object is heavy, Friction, for kick, friction force kicks in because the friction force is coefficient of friction times the normal force. Now, normal force is produced because the weight is present. So all of these concepts work together. And now, whether you are going to move the block or not depends uh, on a few things. How hard do you get to push? Clearly, stronger people can push more. That should be common sense we live in this world. The next thing is, the heavier the thing is, it's harder to push because this may propagates through the, the weight, through the normal force, into the friction. So more weight, you see that the directly is related to more friction. So if you have something that it's one ton in its, in its mass, yeah, the damn thing is gonna be very hard to move because big mass gives rise to big weight, big weight gives the big normal force and the big normal force creates very large friction. So you can't move it unless you push really hard to overcome the friction force. And then uh, at the end, the last thing is which surfaces are rubbing against each other, right? It's difficult to push certain people, right? They're round and heavy and a low center of mass, so yeah. But if you take the same person and put that person on the ice and give it a slight push, it's gonna move. Did you change the weight of the person? No. What did you change? You changed the friction because you changed the mu. You changed the coefficient of friction, which is given in a chart, and that is just simply uh, which two surfaces are getting into a contact. Is it wood on, uh, on concrete? Is it metal on wood? Is it ice on, on wood? And, and so on. So coefficient of friction is something that we measure in the lab, and that is given for any two surfaces that come into a contact. So if you take a heavy block that you can't move anywhere else and you put it on ice, you might be able to move it, right? So that's that because uh, that huge weight, well, the huge mass, which creates huge weight, which creates huge normal force, which creates huge friction, will be countered by the coefficient of friction, which is there from ice. So now, you know, with the application, uh, you can see there are two forces that are acting in the y direction. So sum of all forces in the y direction needs to add to zero, and sum of all forces in the x direction needs to add to zero in order for this object to be in equilibrium. Now, please note that object being in equilibrium doesn't mean object stands still. Object can be in equilibrium while moving as well. Would you agree that this planet is in equilibrium? Yeah, it rotates and it goes around the sun and the solar system rotates in the galaxy and the galaxy rotates and the galaxy moves in respect to other galaxies, right? Planet is in equilibrium, okay? So 
the idea is uh, so just reference points and so on but when you are you know studying the physics you just want the object to be at peace all right just want it to be happy at all times so that means that sum of all forces acting on it are equal to zero now if you add a push right and if you add a second push which force is equal to mass times acceleration right so you are pushing into the object well that case that will ruin the equilibrium and the object will move now this is needed for you to stop the object if the object is moving in respect to things or to cause a motion if the object is standing still in respect to other uh, by the way there is no state of absolute motion or absolute standing still that doesn't exist it only exists in a reference to uh, something else so state of uniformity doesn't exist so um, now you can say maybe you have uh, two tugboats tugging a tanker into a port or you have two people pushing a heavy object uh, all of these things and you simply add all of the x components you simply add all of the y components you make sure everything equals to uh, everything equals to zero now the fun begins when you are on the incline and you have to involve trig uh, to solve these things so if the object is on the incline so now we move this box on the incline and this incline has angle theta good effort so now you have the the weight which is always going to be uh, going perpendicular down so that's FW now normal force is always perpendicular to the surface and no coughing we have the force down the incline which is just the the force uh, applied to the block and directly opposing that is the friction force which is again mu times the normal force please note that in this diagram three forces are lined up with angle theta three forces are at the angle and one force is just in a pure y direction so now you have a choice you know that your formulas are only sum of all y's and sum of all x's now you three of your forces are not given as x's and y's so your choices are to write the components for these three forces and then work with that x's with x's and y's with y's or rotate the system if you rotate the system then your normal force your f force and your friction force all become good old xy forces and the weight force is the only one that is going to be skewed it's a much easier way to solve problems where you have to worry about trig in one vector rather than three vectors bueno and the angle at which this force is rotated is clearly angle theta so if you rotate the system you will have now force w to have its x component and the y component so you have your i and j components ah well i i, I either need uh, x and a y or there you go so if i put x and a y in a subscript i don't have to put i and j and looking at the diagram you are going to see that the uh, x component is uh, going to be the opposite because it's opposite for where the angle is so that's going to be fw sine 
theta plus fw cosine theta to find this. Now the weight is given, so each one of these fw's, these are all vectors, uh, fw is given as mg. So you know that value, right? If the box is 3 kilograms times roughly 10 is 30 newtons. I said 9.81 is the right gravity, so call it roughly 10. So uh, then you would put 30 for these numbers. Uh, coefficient of friction should be given to you, right? That's just, they say mu is 0 0.7, mu is 1.2, right? So you will get the coefficient of friction uh, in the problem. Yes? Oh, uh, why is F uh, sub, uh, sub, 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 Because when we look at the triangle here, Theta is here. See, this I is the y component, this is the x component, and this is the fw component. I put theta by the arrow. That's how I got some Well, theta. Right there. Well, when you when you rotate this diagram, oh. you see that the that the fw swings to the left, right? So this is the opposite side, and opposite is sine over hypotenuse, right? So it's sine. And the y is the, in this case. Uh, it depends on the diagram. That's why you have to draw. Uh, if you're trying to do a physics problem, applied problem without, uh, without diagram, is just a waste of time. <laughs> because you, you try to memorize that x component is always cosine. <laughs> Good luck. You see, there is sine in this example, right? So uh, it depends on the situation. So you have to be very careful about those things. Cool? We'll expand on this problem when we get to that product. We'll, we'll involve work. So that's that for this lecture. Then where's the, yeah, okay, bye.